to welcome Corey Poirier into the studio. This is, I believe, uh, your second time on the show, Corey. That's correct. Okay, and we're here to talk about your new book. But before we do that, I'm going to read uh, your little blog from your website. Uh, your blog from your website. Your little blurb from the website. And it's uh, just for folks that want to know. It's CoreyPoirier.com. C O R E Y. P O I R I E R. So just like it sounds, Curry uh, dot com, and of course people can get in touch with you directly through the website. There's uh, a contact page there. Um, professional speaker, entrepreneur, customer service sales specialist. Corey is uh, the publisher of Island Business News. He's president of uh, Tisti, CEO of Career Alternative Path, uh, Career Alternatives, and was the 2009-2010 president of the Junior Chamber International in Halifax. He's an active member on the board of the BNG of BNG uh, 2000. What is BNG? Stands for Burnside Networking Group. There we go, over in the, the industrial part of Halifax. Uh, award-winning sales professional. He was the youngest in the Canadian division history of Fortune 500 organization he worked for. A successful entrepreneur. His island business news publication is reported the longest-running independent business publication in PEI history and a successful corporate sales manager. He's also an author, and uh, I believe this is um, this uh, new book is your second yeah, uh, that's correct. Book, yeah, uh, and it's. Uh, I guess it's. Um, is it? This is. Uh, a, 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 I guess a sequel to uh, the original one, which was uh, conversations with Islanders, which was very specific about PEI. And in fact, the last time you were on the show, we talked about that book pretty extensively. Um, this time, you've upped the ante. You've gone cross region for conversations with Atlantic Canadians. Uh, welcome to the show, and congratulations. Oh, thank you so much on the new book, and we're going to talk about the new book today because there's lots of really cool names there's a very sexy picture of nancy reagan on the cover i might add we'll have to, we'll we'll have like, to let her know or i guess she officially what, does now yeah well it's one of my closet crushes um and you've even got a quote uh on the back from a this this uh, odd uh, radio show host uh, it's uh, i'll read the quote it's uh, a thoughtful and thought-provoking book an alchemist at heart, Poiré distills every drop of gold out of these everyday islanders until they shine. Intelligent, insightful, highly entertaining, and of course that was for the conversations with islanders. Let's let's jump right in here. I, I take it, given the success of the conversation with islanders, that set the stage for expanding and going across Atlantic Canada. Absolutely, and and what's kind of funny, if you might recall, last time I was here, that was one of the questions that came up. Will there be an Atlanta Canadian book? Yeah. And I have to say that last time around, when I was doing media shows, that was the question that came up more than any other. And I believe it's because at the time I was doing kind of a media blitz on an Islander book mm. outside of Prince Edward Island as well. Yeah, that's true. So this question came up over and over again. So I think I was already had it planned that it had to keep growing further than that. But I think that was a big catalyst for driving it quicker. People asking me over and over again, when is the Atlanta Canadian version coming out? Right, and you've got some you've got some major names here, and a major name, and, and a lot of people I think would might be surprised to find out who's who's uh, of Atlantic Canadian uh, descent. Um, you have um, <laughs> it's a picture of Gene Simmons on the cover, and we'll get to that. Uh, Robin Sharma, one of my favorite people, and uh, you had a chance, I take it, obviously, to speak with with Robin and and connect with uh, him, motivational speaker, uh, author, the monk that sold his Ferrari. Um, and from Port Hawkesbury, absolutely Nova Scotia. Uh, Jonathan Torrens, of course, everybody knows from uh, you know a variety of sources. Uh, whether you were a younger person many years ago or, or a follower of our good friends uh, Bubbles and Gang uh, in recent years, uh, Michael Smith, renowned chef, a PEI native as well. Uh, Jimmy Flynn is on there, who's hilarious. Um, the aforementioned gorgeous Nancy Reagan, uh, and many others. Mark Black, Mark Little right across the the gamut of society uh tell me about the gene simmons picture because there's a picture of gary maxwell on here uh but gene's in the picture as well <laughs> well I'll, I'll answer that uh stephen but i'll also uh maybe interject when you were mentioning about where people are from one of the things that's become exciting for me with the book and unexpected was finding out where people are from that maybe i or other atlanta canadians didn't realize they were from. Right. So, in other words, as you listed some on the front cover, Robin Sharma, for instance, grew up in Port Hawkesbury, but actually was born in Africa. Oh, was he really? Yeah. I didn't know. It was South Africa? I, I thought it was South Africa even before I went back and looked again, but right. he had just uh, said Africa whenever okay. we were doing the interview. But then Jimmy Flynn, everybody I talked to says Newfoundland. Yeah, of course. From Cape Breton. 
Yeah, uh, Jonathan Torrance from Prince Edward Island. Oh, Most people go. say Nova Scotia. Mm. And, and so that's kind of become, I guess, the side joke is that, you know, people uh, thinking somebody's from a different place. And I did a show the other day, and, and one of the guys in the show said, people always think he's from Cape Breton. And he says, no, I'm not, actually. And they say, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> and they actually, that's hilarious. That's an Atlanta Canadian thing, of a cultural thing. Uh, so to go back and answer your, your actual question, your initial question about uh, Gene Simmons and, and Gare, what happened was, uh, I don't know if you remember, Gene came to Moncton to speak. I do. Okay, so he came to speak on branding. And Gare is, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, I guess Gare would call himself probably uh, a branding let's say, expert yes, or guru. absolutely. And, and why I say that is because some other people might say motivational speaker, but I think he would align himself more with branding. So he was speaking at this branding conference and, of course, asked Gene if he could, um, you know, if he could, I, I believe, probably uh, get his picture taken with him or get the book signed or what have you. So it just worked out that uh, Gare ended up having a couple of those pictures for promotional purposes, and I know he sent them out to the press and what have you. So as I'm putting the book together, I'm looking at these pictures and I'm saying, how cool would it be <laughs> to get Gene on the front cover? So I went to Gare and I said, what do you think, Gare? I said, can, uh, can I use those pictures or can I use the picture with you and Gene on the front? And I believe the picture of Gare on the inside is one without him and Gene, or sorry, without Gene in it. So, uh, so yeah, so that was the way we kind of got Gene on the front cover. And I said, uh, even though he's a public figure and, and gave permission to Gare to use it for promotional purposes, I said, it's kind of a win-win because if Gene decided, I'm going to sue this guy, <laughs> I don't know really that That's I could right. lose. You're off the hook. Yeah, uh, a lot of big names in here. Robin Sharma, obviously uh, a big name. You've divided the book up into sections. One of them's chapter one speakers. Some uh, Emilio, you're quite familiar with uh, entertainers. Uh, you have people like Guy Earl and uh, Jimmy Flynn, uh, business leaders who great people like even Rachel Dodds. Like getting her there, what a great idea because she covers you know a gamut of our society, i.e. the sex sector, uh, which doesn't uh, necessarily get the proper uh, acknowledgement that it does. But uh, Jeff Doyle is also in there. Doug Shepard. Uh, then you get into actors, uh, uh, Jonathan Torrance, Kathy Jones, good call. Uh, health and wellness, um, Chef uh, Michael Smith is in there. And then you've got Dina Churchill as well, who's, you know, I've spoken with, uh, very interesting. Um, then you've got some artists and writers, including our good friend Leslie Choice and Carol Little out of PEI, a good, re a good representative. And then uh, you've got some music going on with people like Gordy Sampson, Lenny Gallant, and uh, Halifax's own Scratch Bastard, uh, who I believe put in some time here at CKDU. So it's a real cross-section. And, and, you know, given the diversity, I'm wondering, and this is probably an obvious question to some people, but... Uh, but, you know, what were some of the themes that emerged that sort of all the common denominators amongst people from these, this, this myriad of, uh, of, uh, of disciplines? Well, one of the things that I found kind of interesting is that when I look at common traits among, and, and I think you and I have talked about this, about high achievers, well, they kind of came through even with Atlanta Canadian leaders across all uh, genres, and it's something I believe we talked about, about the common trait among high achievers is that they love what they do. True. So it's the passion. So if I if I singled it out to one thing that was common across the board, it was passion. Maybe a secondary thing was that I noticed that with the, with among these people we interviewed is that they were almost all great communicators, mm -hmm. or at least strive to become better communicators. Right. So those would be two, and probably a a, a storytelling ability. So if I were kind of summing up three common traits that I noticed in talking to these people and the themes that emerged, it would be that these people love what they do, they're good communicators, and naturally, because they're good communicators, they know how to tell the story. Yes, and I think, you know, that is, those are Atlantic Canadian traits. Uh, in fact, all three of them would be. Um, and, and I think they really stand out in each of their respective fields inspirationally because they're so, each of them are so willing to go out into the public to talk about these things uh when you think of someone like michael smith like he's all over the media all the time you know and he's very supportive and encouraging he even goes into these small little uh home-based cooking classes in and around uh you know charlottetown summerside and so forth or you get somebody like um uh like well obviously robin sharma has done a lot of volunteer work down in uh, Nova Scotia coming in and, and carrying his message. Leslie Choice, I mean, just uh, publishes important books that need to be published. Uh, and then you get people like Gordy Sampson and Lenny Gallant who have been just overwhelmingly philanthropic in their, in their efforts to just uh, quietly go about their business and, and be seen and heard and contribute. And that is also another very strong Atlantic Canadian trait. Absolutely. And, and I have to say, one of the things that I mentioned in at the first of the book that really kind of for lack of a better term, blew me away, and I think I even used those words in the uh, intro, was just the 
amount of achievements. And, you know, and I know we re- we measure achievements sometimes by, uh, you know, what is this person, how is this person measured in the public eye or what have you. But I was just blown away when you started adding up things like uh, people in Atlanta, Canada shared the bill with Shania Twain or were on David Letterman or taught Seinfeld mm-hmm. uh, or uh, interviewed Oprah or Garth Brooks. I mean, I just don't know that we realize that people from Atlanta, Canada have achieved on a global scale equally to anywhere else in the world. Well, I think about someone like uh, Barb Stegman, entrepreneur, motivational speaker. Uh, uh, you know, she's just uh, gone through the roof over the past year or two, and in fact, to the point where she's named a, an honorary colonel this past weekend here at Greenwood in, uh, in and around the Halifax area. Congratulations, Babs, by the way. Uh, Barb's been on the show a few times, and we're hoping to have her back in in the new year. Um, the uh, the other thing I, I've noticed, especially with regards to the first book, was that the questions that you ask uh, are very penetrating because they reveal a personal side of people here that, you know, sometimes, I mean, the thing about Atlantic Canadians, my understanding is, and I'm a CFA, I'm a, you know, a Montrealer, an uppity Canadian, as they call them, but uh, when I came down here, that immediate hospitality was obvious, the warmth the passion, you know, the the generosity and stuff. And then you kind of hit a wall. There's a sense of reserve or caution with CFAs, which is completely understandable given the history economically, politically, and otherwise. But the books uh, or the questions that you asked penetrated, you know, through those barriers in the first book to get to people's spirit, to their soul and stuff. And, I mean, did you go through that same process with this book? And, and, And how close did you get to people? Did you still feel there was that reserve or did people really open up well it's interesting that's an interesting question as well because i noticed that in my early interviews and and with publishing a newspaper i mean we're up to over a thousand interviews now and and i i I like to think that maybe i grew during the interviews and and noticed what questions weren't bringing out you know i was getting yes you know close into questions that were getting yes (laughs) no my my favorite interviews on the radio by the way (laughs) so what uh you know blah 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 yes (laughs) Okay, and next? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what happened from there? Well, so what happened is is that I watched, I guess hopefully as people we always try to grow, so I watched which questions weren't getting more than just your standard quick yes or no or you know three or four word response and so i just started digging deeper with my questions in hopes to get bigger uh you know bigger answers so i started asking questions about what does passion mean to you or or why do you think you're here or a question like what was the toughest moment of your life and how did you overcome it right. and and as an example and and he's been very open about it and i really respect that because it's a side we don't see of him but jimmy flynn is a great example mm-hmm. his son passed away nine years ago most people don't know that and it obviously had a major impact on his life mm-hmm. and he was willing to share that in the book and and i believe you know that i think we all can relate to things like that and really seeing that opens up a different side of jimmy that we wouldn't see otherwise absolutely the tears of the clown listen we got a question coming in from adam and uh, adam is writing in from toronto very uh, cool expat i'm just flipping through it here oh do you have did you have uh, was there a particular favorite interview or and that's a good question actually was there somebody in the book that really stand out to you thank you adam listening on ciut out of toronto today i would say I mean, I have to, in being honest, and it's not meant to be a political answer, I would say all the interviews I really took a lot from. However, so I can give him a, a, an actual answer that, uh, you know, that, that is more deeper than that. I would say, I mean, obviously Robin Sharma was a big get for me. I really was, uh, I, it was really a big thing for me to want to interview Robin because it's the field I'm in and because he's achieved so much in that field. And, and I really believe what he says. And it was one of those interviews that there was so much insight came out of it. But if I look at somebody who really shocked me, you know, an interview that I went, wow, I didn't realize that, would probably be Richard Wood, Mm -hmm. fiddler from Prince Edward Island. Uh, He's one I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, people who've been on the the David Letterman show and shared the bill with Shania Twain. That is Richard. Wow. And, you know, that type of thing was really powerful. But also to learn that he didn't pick up the fiddle right when he was two years old. And he said, I picked it up late in life, and and I'm going by memory, but I believe it was 12. And I said, how would that be considered late in life? People, you know, pick up the guitar when they're 50 years old. Right. And he said, in his experience, most people cite the, the fiddle and the bagpipes as two of the hardest instruments to learn if you don't start at a young age. So just that insight about that world, also how he feels about the path that uh, people like Ashley McIsaac and Natalie McMaster and himself maybe have uh, opened up for younger 
people to enjoy the fiddle. Right. So I, I think it was probably the idea of the insight about behind the scenes of the life of a fiddler, and at the very same time, the fact that he had actually achieved that much on a, a global scale. And very quietly, if you look at another sort of characteristic of Atlantic Canadians that might tie people together, is that tremendous humbleness. Absolutely. You know, that sense of humility that, uh, you know, I, yeah, I may do this, but I do it very quietly. And I think, and, you know, uh, Dave Carroll of uh, Sons of Maxwell fame and, of course, United Breaks Guitars fame, a perfect example. Here's a guy that, you know, I mean, how many hits did that get on YouTube? Eight kajillion? And he's just quietly continues to go about his business playing local gigs and doing stuff. Absolutely, and it, and it has opened up a lot of doors for him. Uh, you may, you probably realize there or know that uh, he got into the speaking game now. Yes. And so I was talking to him about two weeks ago, I think, and he said he was speaking in Russia. And so it's really, it's opened up a lot of doors. In Russia? In Russia. No kidding. And? Did he, did he bring his guitar? Did he fly United? <laughs> that, you know what? Uh, I'll, I, I finished off the story, and actually, his is the last in the book, I believe. And I finished off the story saying just one thing for sure. The message from this, don't break this man's guitar. <laughs> Absolutely. But, uh, but yeah, he uh, he's speaking now. He's got a book coming out in May uh, through Hay House, mm -hmm. which you're probably familiar yeah, with. Absolutely. Uh, major publisher. Uh, uh, on their list would be like Eckhart Tolle and right. Wayne Dyer. That's right. And uh, so he, that's a whole new life for him. It's almost like a ch uh, act two for Dave. At the same time, it's been uh, rumored that his story's been heard by 100 million people. He was on The View and ABC's 2020 with that story. And you're right. I mean, he's still as, as humble and, and the same person he's always been, in which I, I think that is a, a big Atlanta Canadian trait. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, and it's funny, to, to that end, you know, when you think about, like you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the fiddler uh, for, out of uh, PEI. Um, and uh, to that end, I mean, you know, I, Richard Wood is not somebody who most people would know. Ashley McIsaac, yes. Natalie McMaster, yes. Absolutely. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't mean that someone like Richard Wood doesn't have an equally compelling story. Okay, maybe they haven't had the grand sort of visible or commercial success that, you know, uh, that Natalie or, or, um, or, uh, or Ashley have had, but it doesn't mean they haven't had some significance or contributions as well. Absolutely. And I will say, I tried to, I really tried to go deeper than just who's a known name or a celebrity or what have yeah. you in the book. And so there's some people there that are business leaders that a lot of people may not have heard of who, like you say, their story is just as compelling. And a great example is uh, Bruce and Claudine Sweeney, who mm -hmm. run Simply for Life. Yeah. And Simply for Life now is, I believe they're up to, I think, 30, 36 clinics. I mean, they're opening more every day almost. Right. Uh, 36 clinics across the country. Great branding story, by the way. Yeah, way. absolutely. And, I mean, their company's been built from, uh, I think, I believe it was a two-bedroom in Quis, uh, Pam Sis. Yeah, just outside St. John, that's right. Yeah, and, and they, they were operating out of their basement and said they had so many people going back and forth that somebody ca called the cops because yeah. they thought something fishy was going on. And one <laughs> of the cops great. showed up. <laughs> well, I think this is brilliant. One of the cops showed up, and he ended up joining the program. Oh, that's fantastic. But their story is amazing that they've, they've grown so much. Uh, and they said one of the challenges they run into is they go to major conventions, and people can't believe they're operating this franchise from St. John, New Brunswick. Yeah. So that's a great success story that a lot of people still are just learning about. And, and, and you know, and it's, I'm doing a series of articles right now that I'm writing about uh, entrepreneurship and capital investment and venture capital here in Atlantic Canada. And it's been very dormant for a long time, and there are a lot of challenges to face. But you can't deny it. There are a lot of amazing ideas that come out of this part of the world. Absolutely. I mean, I've heard... You know, some things that people have said to me, even just strategies for their business, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that I, I have, I've traveled all over, essentially, and, and as a speaker traveled to uh, throughout North America, and some of the ideas for strategies, business strategies I've heard in Atlanta, Canada, you know, blow my mind. And you think about a company like Radian 6 out of New Brunswick, and all of a sudden they've gone from just being this, again, sort of basement operation, growing a little bit, and then all of a sudden a little bit of funding, a little bit of investment through a COA. You know, in different programs in and around New Brunswick, and boom, they're on the international stage like that. Yeah, it's the good thing is is that we're not, I guess, excluded anymore or not sheltered like people have always believed. When I was growing up, I was not taught, but it was almost implied that I, if I wanted to be highly successful, I had to move away. Right. And right. and I did it. I, I moved to Alberta for seven years, and and I said in the first book, you you may remember, I said that. Before I moved, I was running a newspaper. <laughs> I moved away, spent seven years there, worked for a Fortune 500 company, learned a lot. But I moved back, and as I was writing the book, I realized that I was running a newspaper again. And so the message became, move not necessary. 
Right. That's doing the same right. thing I, before, you know, I was doing the same thing then as I was doing before I left. That's so. right. I mean, that sort of have-not mentality has been prevalent here for many generations, you know, and uh, some of it is sort of self-imposed. There's no two. It's, you know, that is a decision we make in our life to see ourselves as being of lack or of being of, of non-lack. Um, but uh, that's changing with the younger generation here. I find young people in particular, a few of which here are featured in the book, including Nikki Payne uh, and Jonathan uh, Torrens as well, that, uh, you know, you can be successful. You can have a vibrant career here. I mean, think of the numbers out of Cape Breton to think that 20% of young people out-migrate you know, by the time they're 22 years old. I mean, that's astounding to me. Not only do we do we have to bring these people back, but we have to just entice the ones that are here not to leave because they can develop. In fact, there's a whole new campaign, Nova Scotia Television ads, that uh, is all about, you know, taking pride in your province and being from here. And that's, that's a real mindset change. I mean, that's going to take perhaps a couple of generations to get to, but it can be done. Well... That's one of the, I guess, underlying messages in the book is that I, I've been I've been running with the slogan lately that Atlantic Canada matters. Right. And it's, in fact, even the Facebook page for the book. And that's the underlying theme. Is My hope is somebody will read this book and go, wow, I didn't realize that was possible. Get inspired and say, well, if they can do that here, and if, if people can do that here and achieve that success, I don't have to move away. That's right. Or I can move back home. And so that is kind of my hope is what what you're talking about. I realize that this one book isn't going to do it, but maybe it's it's part of the part, part of the puzzle. That's just right, like the shipbuilding is part of, that, part of the puzzle. That's it exactly. Uh, it's power of example. It's it's. I mean, words are one thing, and we're very good at words with the Lancanians. We talked about the storytelling element earlier, but it's taking action. So you know, self-publishing a book, and we're going to talk about that after we get back from the music break. Okay. Uh, Stephen Clare here with Corey Poirier on the book club. Uh, folks, stick around. We'll be back right back with more talk. In the meantime, we'll send this one out to you know who. Thank you. 
stones that never surface. I'm frightened by the storms that never surface. That one going out to you know who today. Uh, Stephen Patrick Clare here on the Book Club Tuesday afternoon. We're in studio with author, entrepreneur, motivational speaker, sales expert Corey Poirier. Uh, originally from, uh, I believe, Prince Edward Island. Originally from Prince Edward Island. Absolutely. Born and, and raised. And you still spend uh, part of the time there, but of course you have. Uh, you have Halifax uh, is very present in your life as well. You're here on a weekly, if not regular basis. Uh, yeah, I have a place in uh, in Halifax and, and a place in PEI, but uh, my uh, my two pets, they call Halifax home. So gotcha. I guess that makes and my, my uh, license plate <laughs> calls Nova Scotia home. So I guess there Nova Scotia's home for now. There you go. Uh, Tim had a question. Tim, thanks for writing in. In fact, a couple of other questions have come in. We won't be able to get to all of them, but uh, he wants to know, and I think it's a good question, did anybody turn you down or was there? And to further that point, was there anybody afterwards that you thought of and said, don't, I should have had them in? But the, I, there wasn't anybody that just kind of said, not interested. I have to say that. And, and that's, I guess, an applaud to Atlanta Canadians, that they were right. saying this is a good cause. And I, I believe that's why they did it, most of them, is they said there, there's a good cause here to show that Atlanta Canada does matter. The only, off Atlanta Canada does matter. The only, off top of my head, too, that we talked about it and it just, for various reasons, couldn't, you know, didn't come together, was uh, Ashley McIsaac was one. And uh, you mentioned earlier Barb Stegman. And I've had Barb in uh, at, you know, talking at our seminars. We've had her in our publication, but it was just more of a, a timing thing and just trying to bring it together. I think, and, and a lot of it is timing with someone like Barb, certainly, absolutely. Um, looking ahead, and I know we're jumping up ahead, the obvious question is the next book, Conversations with Canadians. I'm thinking, is that already started? I know I'm jumping the gun here on this question, but I want to get to it because Peter wrote in and asked about it. <laughs> no, no worries at all. And it is, it's, it's, uh, it's something I'm working on. It's each time I'm finished one, and, and uh, this is probably something that you would teach other people, Stephen, is that you should always be working on your next book. Mm -hmm. it, like it's, you should always have a book on the go. So the funny part, the challenge now is that I still want to put in more conversations with Islanders. And now as soon as I put this out, everybody's saying, oh, you didn't put this person in. So now I'm wanting to work on conversations with Atlanta Canadians. Uh, so more conversations with Atlanta Canadians. But, yes, the, the, I'm, I'm also working on conversations with Canadians and I've even talked to uh, somebody that you and I've talked to. I've, I've started the process of trying to connect with David Suzuki mm -hmm. to get uh, him in conversation with Canadians when it does come together. I think, you know, Canada 25 years ago, you wouldn't nearly have the selection that you have today. Well, I'm even running, and the answer is yes, and, and I'm even running into that with Atlanta, Canada, because you mentioned, uh, you asked the second part of the question, is there anybody that I said, don't, I should have had in it? And people are saying it to me, they're saying, oh, you should have put so-and-so in the book. And one yesterday I was thinking of that somebody uh, had mentioned about a week ago was Jimmy Rankin. Mm. I mean, he'd be perfect for their book. Absolutely. Or uh, Matt Anderson for New Brunswick. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant blues player. He lives in Halifax now, though. Oh, d does he? Yeah, he lives here full time now. Oh, yeah. See. I think he just met of the loop. Yeah, I know, but he is a proud New Brunswicker. Absolutely. No, I mean, there's tons of people when you think about, uh, you know, uh, a lot of Atlanta Canadians who don't necessarily broadcast like Robin Sharma that they're from. You know, Atlantic Canada. I guess for Robin, it just doesn't come up in conversation and stuff. I mean, he went to Toronto to work for the federal government many, many years ago uh, and then gave up that career in law or put it on hold. Uh, you know, he is a, a special advisor to me in that regard. It's wonderful. Um, the other option you have, of course, is to put stuff on the website. And, uh, folks, you can contact Corey directly through the website. It's CoreyPoirier.com. And, uh, but, you know, putting some of maybe uh, the interviews or, uh, you know, that didn't necessarily make it into the book for whatever reason up on the website is a value add. A lot of authors are doing that kind of stuff today. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at doing that both on the Facebook page that we're starting to build and that's one aspect of it. I, in that case, I'm looking to put quotes and stuff from the stories that are in there, and maybe even quotes that, like you said, from stories that didn't make it. But I'd also like to look at maybe doing a podcast or some sort of thing around, like you say, the stories that didn't make it or may never make it, or a scenario with Barb where maybe that's an easier fit. Mm -hmm. Since we already 
did do a, an original story with Barb. Maybe yeah. we can take a piece of that, and I'll talk to her and, and put those type of things up on the website so people still get to read those and see those. Well, I think the, the idea of getting multimedia with regards to the stuff, people want visuals, they want audio, they want everything print all in one. You know, and, and surf and scan culture and, and making it very accessible. That way, Facebook is a wonderful tool in that regard. Uh, and so it's, it's conversations with Atlantic Canadians is what the Facebook. Well, actually, what it is, it's Facebook.com. And, and I say backslash. I mean, I, I assume you'd look it up under the same way, but backslash Atlantic Canada Matters. Atlantic oh. Canada Matters, so they can find you and friend you. Yes, absolutely. On there. And you, do you do Twitter as well? Yeah, I do uh, Twitter and and uh, LinkedIn. Somebody said to me the other day, is, he asked the question, he didn't give the answer, is, is LinkedIn the adult <laughs> Facebook? And I don't know the answer to that. I would say it's more the business Facebook. It's definitely a business Facebook. But LinkedIn has uh, sort of been very quietly under the radar, really picking up in popularity. I mean, I get invitations tenfold today than I would even just a few months ago. Yeah, actually, for me, my LinkedIn, which and I should use it more often, my LinkedIn followers, is almost half as much as my Facebook followers, and it happened without me even realizing that it was growing at that pace. Yeah, so sure. I think I, LinkedIn's become a big... It has, and I think in, in, in... I know with Facebook, you have to accept friend requests. Twitter, people just follow you. What happens on LinkedIn? Well, and, and just to, to mention the Twitter thing, I'm still... I think most people that I talk to are still struggling <laughs> with the Twitter side of things. How do I make this work for me? And, and I'm sort of at that place as well, so I, I, I have to say I don't use it as much as the other two. Uh, but LinkedIn... What I what I noticed from using it is it's more a of a communication tool, almost like uh, virtual meetings. So it's it's more of a communication tool for people uh, from a professional perspective, where you really don't ever say that I'm brushing my teeth right now, <laughs> right? Or here's or a picture of my dog, or or whatnot and stuff. Nonetheless, social media is helping to drive awareness for authors. Let's uh, talk. Uh, we still have five minutes left here. Self publishing the 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 decision to self publish these days I think is a smart one actually um, was it was it a matter of demand supply was it a matter of just personal preference what what made you uh, self publish the first book and then again this one well well I will say that I'm, I'm talking with publishers right now mm -hmm. regarding a completely different book but I, I kind of have decided once I self published the first one that I want to keep this kind of I guess you could say series uh, if I can call it that, almost like you know, a, a tiny, 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 minuscule version of Chicken Soup for the Soul. I, I want to kind of build this as a, a self-published brand, and the reason is, is because my discovery is that people do want to read about culture and Atlanta Canadians in this case, and our heritage and things like that, to the level where I believe it'll do just as well as a self-published book, mm -hmm. and, and I. I I hate to say it, but I think it offers more flexibility for all involved. Sure, it does. Absolutely, it does. I so that was the, a big part of the reason. But I will say as well, and and you know maybe we can work to correct this. But uh, when I did talk to publishers about it before, I realized that the self-published route would be more up my alley. One of the challenges I ran into is a lot of them were telling me they can't get funding for this type of book, which to me is kind of almost ironic. I mean, you think. This is the kind of book you'd want funding for. Especially if you have other authors in there and, you know, maybe some of those authors are on their publishing list or whatnot, you know. You'd think they want the promotion. They, it, you know, it's, it's a bit of a paradox. But, I mean, there are a lot of advantages to self-publishing. I think with something like Conversation with Canadians, a national book, you can look to a major name publisher. I think that's a, an idea that will be picked up on like that. And you know what? I, haven't, I won't throw out the names, of course, but uh, I, I have been talking to two publishers in regards to that so it's in the works but uh, as you know the publishing road it's it's a longer process it is it's a longer process in the meantime you're going to carry on with business usual because you're out there speaking you're putting together presentations for companies do you bring the book along as part of that package you know i with the islanders one i brought it along but i didn't really promote it because of the fact that my discovery was that the islanders book for lack of a better way of saying it for other people in Atlanta, Canada, unless they were an Islander, they were related to an Islander, it, it probably wasn't as special to them maybe because they didn't know the people in the book. Right. And as you know, we always say, who's your cousin in Atlanta, Canada? Exactly. That's great. <laughs> so so the Atlanta Canadian one, absolutely, it'll be coming out on the road with me. But right now, I've been so busy with uh, getting the message out, but also getting it into stores. That's been what's consuming my time. And because it's just before Christmas, just like last year, releasing it just before Christmas, I haven't even had time to think about uh, the New Year approach. But really, yeah, it'll be coming on the road with me, and you'll also see a lot of uh, book launches. Uh, we're planning to do three, at least three talks at the, the libraries uh, around HRM and bringing people that are in the book and doing a Q&A right in front of the audience. So there's well, a lot I mean, of stuff in the The works. interactive element is very important in that regard. 
Uh, the book, I guess, can be picked up online via the website, CoreyPoirier.com. Folks, uh, thanks for all the questions, and uh, I'm going to redirect them to Corey uh, and so forth, and he'll be in touch that way. Um, the book is also available, I take it, in, in bookstores. Yeah, it's we try to take a unique approach, being self-published, again, flexibility, and, and put it in more stores than you would maybe find a traditional book. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a store you might be familiar with called The Hunt Club. Yes, absolutely. Which is a, kind of a store for men that's licensed, <laughs> I guess, with... TVs. It's a totally cool store. Absolutely. And and actually, uh, Chrissy, Adam Schofield, uh, they're kind of behind the scenes. They actually own the store. So it's cool because she's in the book and, and that wasn't intentional. Uh, so it's there. Also, another kind of connection is the Sugar Daisy yep. shop in Truro, which yep. is... I guess you could say affiliated with Jonathan Torrance, yeah, that's and right. he's in the book. Yeah. Uh, so, but we're also uh, so at books uh, at the Bookmark, for instance, chapters, uh, Doctor Dina Churchill's office. Yeah, right on. So, I guess you could say we've kind of went run the gamut of bookstores for sure. But then on top of that, we tried to find unique areas as well. Because it's, I think it's a book that uh, doesn't necessarily. I mean, it caters to all audiences. You don't have to be a particular demographic or background or whatever to read it and enjoy it. Everybody can enjoy it. Um, CoreyPoirier.com is the website. People can go there and contact you directly. Corey, it's been great having you in. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, we'll do it again, uh, certainly before the next book comes out. In fact, let's make it a fairly steady gig if we can and come and talk about books. And, I, you know, the whole idea of just... Uh, of just uh, bringing Atlantic Canada to the world. I mean, that, that very much is our mandate here in the radio show, and you do that very well, so congratulations. Oh, thank you.